So this is part two with Nick Lorenz. And uh, part one was really getting to know so much of your backstory, which is so helpful because everybody brings into this job a history, a history of where they were born, a history of what they uh, you know, were exposed to as far as traumas, as well as good experiences. And you talked about redefining your life in part one from childhood and how you created essentially two separate childhoods for yourself. One was filled with not so many good things. And then after 10 years old, you filled it with all of the stuff you want to carry forward with you. Um, you also talked about your time getting into the military and how that shaped you and, and where your drive came from to try to become a firefighter, you know, always wanted to be number one, be the best, you know, and anything that you did, you gave it 110% to make sure that you stood out as doing your personal best. Didn't sound as though it was really competition to anybody else. It was more com competitive to yourself, you know, mm -hmm. to make sure that, you know, you could get that approval from your dad you know, and make sure that you were really accepted by everybody else. So let us, let us uh, try to transition now across to, to, to where you are as far as PTSD and, uh, and transitioning across to how this has really shaped your life. Nick, you had started to talk about post-traumatic stress disorder in your first segment. And I wanted to, to hear from you now as you transition across to file you talked uh, kind of like I had talked about with Sergeant Dan Green not too long ago about PTSD from a thousand cuts or, uh, you know, just the trauma and everyday stuff of the job catching up to you as opposed to the immediate, you know, shooting or blood, guts and gore. Um, you know, so if you can tell me what this was like for you now as you entered fire service and, and your time over there. Thank you. Certainly. Yeah, thank you once again for this opportunity to, to um, say too much, and go uh, be too long winded, but but it's but there's a lot right everybody if you're watching this you know someone or you're experiencing this yourself there's a lot there's a lot to unpack for each and every person but. Um, you know when I entered the fire service it started off just kind of how I hoped it imagined. Um, not necessarily hope but imagined uh, a trailer fire uh, with a fatality. Welcome to the fire service. And this was interesting because I had to look back and, and you're talking about PTSD in the fire service and it's it's um, a path. And then that first call, we lost uh, on that fatality, which did not did not affect me. I but I consoled the captain. It's a brand new probie, third shift, and the captain had just had a kid, and one of the fatalities was unfortunately a child. And that really rocked him. But but looking back, I was impressed that he was so open and vulnerable because that wasn't really him. And but it obviously caught him uh, very very emotionally and in that moment. So I was outside and I didn't know what to do. I was still again 23, 24, and here's a captain who I look up to, going, "Wait, this isn't supposed to happen. We just had a uh, we had a good fire, but." Unfortunately, there was a death, but this is the job, right? Mm -hmm. And I ended up consoling and, and, and um, hugging and, and making him feel better. And I, I just felt like that was a, that made sense. I felt like a healer in a role. Mm -hmm. Now, the reason I preface with that is fast forward throughout my career, I always had connections. The crews that I worked with, uh, once I worked with a crew before even promoting, we were incredibly tight. Um, always, always wanting to know about people and investing in you know, them as well with me, but I just really loved the interconnectedness of people. And on calls, so we get into PTSD and on calls, the calls weren't bothering me. It was what I was thinking about myself based on the outcome. So it was, you suck, you couldn't save them, or maybe your dad's right, you weren't good enough. But fast forward into this, um, you know, I'm drinking, I'm, I'm numbing, and I'm watching every other firefighter, and not every other, but most do the same way in some way. Cope with something. And, and, and you know, uh, uh, others have better means of coping. I didn't realize it, but for me, it was drinking, you know, chewing tobacco, anything I could to take the edge off, um, 
if I got a night of sleep, that was bonus. But hmm. when I started having kids, for the first time, the kid call was uh, more intense. Um, wasn't just a, a, a fatality. Like, wow, a five-year-old. Now it was, this isn't right. Mm -hmm. Why are my kids alive? Why did this family have to just be destroyed? Why was I here? Why couldn't I help? You know, you just inner processing, none of this out loud. And of course, for most departments, the, the, there's CISD and there's other means. But after a traumatic incident, on every fatality call I've ever been on, no ding on anyone here. The system will improve. Is And that's one of my biggest goals too, was to improve the service that we provide to us providers. It's, it's, it's got to improve. Okay. So it was, hey, usually a captain or chief, you guys good? Good. And here you are as a new person. What are you going to say when the three and four of the dudes around you with muscles and mustaches and tattoos and time on are like, yeah, I'm good. Mm -hmm. I'm good. You good? In front of everyone? I mean, that, that, that part has to stop. And I know they've made uh, efforts to change that. But you know what? Here's the fact. I was good at the time. And so were those guys. We're full of adrenaline, rolling in sweat. You know, the heart's pumping. We're going to go get some chow now. Uh, you know, move on to distract, think about anything else, run the next call. You don't have time to even process things. So what I didn't realize, and I've learned these things through, through my own uh, readings and education and counseling, but looking back, these were little micro things that you just miss. Number mm -hmm. one, you don't have a chance. I didn't have a chance to be honest and go, well, fuck no, excuse my language. Mm -hmm. I'm not good. And neither are you. And either are you. We just watched a two-year-old die. You're, no one's good here, you know. So, but, but at the time it didn't, didn't really bother me, but you start to, and I wasn't overthinking these, but they, but like the, the sergeant said, that's one cut and you do it again. Mm -hmm. And then, then maybe it's that call and it's not a kid related, but something else is bothering you and you start to question it all. Um, and, and for me, I wouldn't acknowledge the PTSD. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I was drinking. I was just, I was, I was excelling. You know, I don't have that type of stuff. I'm coaching my kids, you know, all my, I'm heavily involved parent, you know, just promoting good reputation. Things are going well, but what you don't realize is, is that the cuts are just adding up and you just neglect. And here's another thing we didn't address and we talked about in the last segment, and that was, not only do we, did you say a person may feel like they don't have the right, and that is so well said, that certainly applies for me, but I also believe that there's a very, very big fear of reputation and what this will mean for how I'll look. That was definitely the case for me. I'm not asking for help, and I hid the alcoholism for eight years because I was excelling. Like, it's not a problem. I wouldn't acknowledge it. I was getting help. Like, yeah, I knew it ran in my family genes. But, you know, I'm promoting, I'm, I'm dad of the year, this, this, no, it's just something isn't making sense. And compared to every other firefighter, maybe I'm not drinking too much. Mm -hmm. um, so I think these you little also, cuts. You also, you also had cultural stuff too, right? I mean, because you, here you were special forces, you, the way that you partied was different. You know, you guys did everything to excess, having fun. You know, uh, so you were larger than life. And so the drinking doesn't really measure up to the height of, of who you were, right? Right. It was a small little dark secret that I was just going to keep right there, you know, and I'll get, I'll get better eventually. And I think that's the hope of a lot of people before you start coming out. Now, this was important because once I did vocally come out, um, you know, that went, that went about as well as I guess I expected. There was some support and some raised eyebrows. Um, and I said, screw it. I'm going all in on this. I'm going all in on this. And I did. And, um, you know, that backfired a little bit because it was like, okay, hey, a year later, calm down. I knew there was some passion about addiction and drinking. And I knew there were so many others doing it. So I want to fast forward then. 
um, to 2015 and 16, because now I'm really, I, I don't realize how bad I am. And I have my dreams. This is important. I get to my dream station, dream station, dream crew, dream shift. We're good. I'm good for life. If I decide to come up for battalion chief, that's on me. I will write out my career here. I'm ARF, airport rescue firefighting at the Scottsdale Air Park, facilities captain, doing recruit training academies, enjoying a, um, a very solid reputation. Not everyone's going to like you when you're a go-getter. <laughs> um, so, you know, I cared about my crew. Things were there. And throughout 15 and 16, I, I uh, wasn't sleeping at the fire station, even when we slept. Mm -hmm. I would be feeling, um, I would be calling out and, and my, not telling my wife, I would use a sick day and go and hang out in the valley, not leave the valley, go to casinos and gamble all day, anywhere I could to hide, to not be at work. I would go to work, often say I had to go home and, and run to, to get out of there because I would be shaking or in the bay, just pacing. Why can't I sleep? What's wrong with me? Not once was I saying, Nick, you should get some help. It was life. It was maybe it's this, maybe, oh, you know what? The kids, it's just that I shouldn't coach. I got too much on my plate was what people would say. Hey, you need to take a break. Slow down. I wasn't frantic. I was just an overachiever. Mm -hmm. And it was all driven by not just approval from my dad, but approval from everyone because I had no self-approval. I had no self-worth. If you, people would look at me and go, you have the wife, the kids, like F you, you've got it all. And inside, I'm a worthless piece of crap who doesn't deserve any of it, who's really an alcoholic that no one knows about. No one knows, you know, your dirty, dark secrets and, and that drove that guilt. So from, from 15 and 16, in 2016, this was big. I started driving to work every day, every shift. And this feeling started getting more intense. And that was the feeling of driving my Volvo, an old Volvo, as fast as I could on the 101 North, right into a pylon. Mm -hmm. My family's good for life. It's not a suicide. It's on the way to work. It's accidental. This is the clean getaway. Mm -hmm. And then I remember one day going, holy crap, what are you thinking? Like I came back into myself. Then the next shift would be, I hate this, I hate this. I would yell and scream the whole way there. I fucking hate life and work. It just, what's wrong with me? I'd sit in the bay, I'm sorry, sit in the parking lots mm -hmm. and just like go, oh, you gotta do this, man. You gotta get in there. You gotta do this, you know, for your crew, for your guys, for your family. And the kind of the joke was my wife and I would tease and, and, and her mom who was in my inner circle of, you know, Nick's got problems, you know, I mean, I did gambling and drinking, but boy, he's a good dad and he's got a great job. Mm -hmm. What would we do without that job? My wife's at home, staying home the last three years. And so I'm working overtime. I'm, I'm teaching at the community college shift after shift for nine straight, almost, almost, almost a year. It started subtly was this is the shift I ended right here on the way. Then it was when I left shift. Then it was avoidance of all kind. I wouldn't talk to anyone from the fire service. I wanted nothing to do with the fire service. I wouldn't talk about work at all. I was be. I thought I was just a cynical. You know, I am burnt out a little bit. Maybe I do need to promote. Maybe I should change stations. Maybe you're just not sleeping because life is is you know it's an election year. It's 2016. I don't know. Maybe there's just a lot going on. And I just remember getting to work, going, man, dude, it's not normal to drive to work every day and want to kill yourself consider that option over so one day it had been getting worse and worse and i had been losing weight um which wasn't completely unusual you know i always uh, fluctuate five ten pounds mm -hmm. but i knew i wasn't sleeping for nine months i hit it so well for years that i had a battalion chief and a good friend who was his fit or an assistant trying to become a battalion chief come by the station this has never happened. And we talk on the tarmac or outside the bay near the airport. And they said, you know, is everything okay? And I'm sitting on the bench looking at the concrete. And that was my opportunity to get the help, 
to maybe start a different road. But I continued to do what I had done forever. And that was, no, why? What's going on? But I paused for a second and I noticed that. And they just said, I don't know, we're seeing unusual things you're doing. You know, you're sending emails that don't make sense for you. You know, you got a complaint. I mean, nothing. This is all minor for a guy. So anyway, um, I, I know I'm long-winded. I apologize, Doc. But it was big that I I think a lot of people will mask. And, and firefighter suicide kills me on the inside. It kills us all. And police suicide. Because now I see why that person did that. So they asked for help. One of the few, maybe a month later, now it's boiling over. And this was the shift. I use four hours of sick time. I'm sitting in the parking lot at 11.59, and now it's 12. I'm supposed to be in at work. So I do the hardest thing, and this was the hardest thing. I grabbed my cell phone and called my battalion chief, and I said, I'm not good. I'm really fucking bad. And he, we talked for a minute, and he said, get over and see me right now. Or he was going to come see me. I'm, I'm in my car. I can come see you. He goes, and I'm very close to the battalion station. He goes, do me a favor. Before you do that, call Firestorm. I called Firestorm. <sighs> I didn't know what Firestorm was. The reason I appreciate what Firestorm does is they have connected me with a counselor. I have seen that counselor to this day. I know that is not normal, that a lot of people will, will really have to work to find the right counselor for them. They connected me with the right counselor, said the right things. I saw my chief, talked to him. He saw what a mess I was and said, it's best you go home. Let me give you a ride. I was able to drive. Like that embarrassment was too much. Doc, that is the last time I've ever worn a uniform. No formal retirement. I went home and everything went downhill from there. And that's when... It, I, I feel like um, I, the implosion, the explosion happened and it came out. Once I was home for the next couple months, I had a buddy of mine who recognized I was in bad shape. And he, he said, are you on vacation or something? I said, ah, oh, just a temporary, I couldn't even talk right at the time. Anyone I ran into was concerned because I'm pretty energetic as it is, but I was a mess. I couldn't formulate words. I couldn't talk. I was in constant fear. And, uh, I, I, every turn I was going to die, but now this time I didn't want to die because I had had that anger and suicide for nine months. Um, but now I felt like everywhere I turned, everything was out to get me. When I went to my first couple of counseling, I told her you got to lock the door because they're going to come barging in to, to take me back. Um, I realized it. And I, logistically, and the department, the union, I had people donate hundreds and thousands of hours to help me keep, to stay home and get better. I started using medical marijuana as a patient, prescribed one of the only that really significantly took me from this frantic, I, I, I couldn't talk, like you need a tranquilizer almost. And I didn't need a tranquilizer. I would use that and it was like, it slowed everything down. It was amazing i remember hearing my some of my buddies who were did some heavy stuff in um you know middle east and these were not drug people who use drugs and when they switched to that so that's another topic in itself but for me i don't i don't condemn or condone it i medicine and medications are specific with the patient and the doctor but but that but the reason i bring that up is that was huge because they wanted to get me back on light duty and I had a prescription. I was a legal marijuana, medical marijuana patient. And it was the only thing, one of the few things keeping me calm and alive. Mm -hmm. And it was, you need to have no, um, no, none of that in your system in four weeks to come back and even be on light duty. If it is, there's no light duty. And then we'll have to approach that. I said, I will be there in four weeks. There was never, ever going to be there in four weeks. Mm -hmm. Not because of medical marijuana, because... I, I would go to the store if I went out in public and there was about seven, eight months where I didn't even go out. I hid in my backyard of my house, hid. I retired in August of 2017, official medical retirement. And it was the most hellacious road from October of 2016, my last shift to August of 2017. I wish that upon no one. It was horrific. It was ugly. I was going to see doctors 
Um, I couldn't think straight. I had to get escorted places. My wife was taking me to the, you know, downtown to some psychiatric place when I'd had bad days on advice from my counselor. And um, I, I am a walking mess. And I get the medical retirement. But when I had to go see these IMEs, independent medical examiners, I'm like, what the fuck am I doing here? You know, oh, we have to make sure you have. So I had to prove. I, I, there's nothing to prove. They could see me. I was a, I was a mess. Mm -hmm. One guy was like, "You need to be on tranquilizers." I was so scared. So, I have. I'm coaching baseball at the time. Everyone knows something's up because I'm not acting right, but I hit it and hit it well. August comes around. I officially retire, and I, you know, not once that I've been back. Not once was there a formal thing. They sent me the helmet. A guy dropped off gear. If I saw anyone related to the fire service that I knew out in public, I ran from the store to my car. I uh, would cry at the thought of having to talk to one of them. Hey, just come back and do, we'll do some stuff, some filings. I had to go to HR and it was like I was in um, disguise, hat down, glasses and hoodies on. It was just the most horrific thing. I was in meetings with, with the city and HR and, and there was no talking to me. They talked to my wife. I called the Phoenix Union to see if they could help. You know, Scottsdale Unions was wonderful. But I talked to the Phoenix Union because everything I was running into was kind of dead ends. And I didn't know anything. I was not being told anything. It, kind of the fate and mercy were in everyone's hands. And God, thank God for the union and the department. They took care of me because I ended up with the medical retirement due to PTSD. But um, uh, after, after that, was when things really started to begin. After that was, I thought, okay, the retirement happened. I was coaching baseball, now what? And that's when my life really, really fell apart. I was doing some counseling, starting EMDR, trying different medications. I had no idea the work had just begun. Then I became suicidal for almost two years. And when I say suicidal, Every day in the backyard, I had to search for a reason to not do it. And I hated, hated my kids because they were the only reason that I didn't kill myself. The only damn reason. And that does choke me up a little because I'm so grateful for that because I remember the intensity. I remember my daughter going to the dogs, uh, not the mall with my wife, which they never do. I'm out hiking. I, I walked a lot. I walked by myself. I knew I would see no one in the deserts. Where you want to go hike Camelback? And not in a million years, I might run into someone. I hiked by myself in complete isolation. I stayed in my backyard, kept myself as busy as I could. I read more books than I've ever read. I had headphones on to listen to podcasts. I was knee deep into stuff I'd never been into. I, I had denial of diagnosis. When I saw my letter and heard the word CPTSD and PTSD, I said, that's not me. I do not have that. I spent a year holding myself back from progress because I denied my diagnosis. Because I was going to get to the bottom of it and I had to get healthy. That was my whole job in life again was to get healthy. Get healthy, Nick. Like there was no getting back. That was done and over. Now it was get healthy and don't die. Don't kill yourself. And um, I remember that wasn't the reason. Like whatever it was, that wasn't it. And as we started counseling and EMDR and other methodologies, you peel the onion back. And I knew I had a long road. I didn't know how long of a road. And that road continues on, by the way. There is no finish line. There is no uh, journey's over. I'm good here. You learn how to live again. And I had to re -enter. I had to completely transform myself into basically what you see today and it took it's taking and it's still ongoing four years and during that time though of suicide like I said I was very angry at my kids and when I say that they didn't know that I was angry with them because their mere existence kept me alive my wife's mere existence kept me alive and I can see and during that time three firefighters killed themselves in this time each time they did I said I'm, that's it I'm doing it and when I would step up to that line to do it, I found this. And I want to talk, this may be another talk, but the doc, suicide was one of the most 
liberating experiences in my life. When I realized it dawned on me that I have control of nothing in my life, but I can control that, it freed me. It was like I sank and went because I was listening to a philosopher who said, if you're su this is out of context, but the, the, it, a wonderful philosopher, but they said, the thing about life is the only thing to contemplate is whether to kill yourself or not. Mm. You have to ask yourself, is the, is the candle worth, you know, or the, the game, is the game worth it? It is worth it. And I remember going, I could do this at any time. I have complete control. You want to do it, do it. It's, you could do it anytime or not do it and see what happens. The curiosity of those damn kids and my daughter bringing home a little dog. I did not want a dog. She forbade me. I told her, do not, do not twice on the phone, bring that dog home. <laughs> I should show you the hundreds of pictures that dog I, so anyway the, the joke was the, we rescued a dog and that dog ended up rescuing me mm -hmm. incredible that's another story so the dog story but um, what, what throughout this journey I was learning I, I had to know about this once I decided to get into the mental health like acknowledge it that my life had completely been transformed I had to understand it and that helped it was also severely depressing. I was listening to people just like me, but much, much um, more charismatic and smooth, <laughs> a little more polished, a little more polished <laughs> with, with storytelling. So it's not a five hour story, but I listened to strangers on YouTube, on, on, on channels like, uh, like yours, for example, I didn't know. I, I, I found about Blue Pass recently, but I did not know about all the resources out there. Um, you know, you try to ignore, like, I didn't want to get into it for a while. So as things developed, as we peeled the onions back, I realized we had a long ways to go and it was going to be a horrific road. And, and this is when I asked myself, Nick, what's your job? Your job is to get better and you're investing in you for the first time. All you've ever done is give yourself to others. And I mean, on calls. The, the, the kid call, the kid that died, those kids, I didn't just leave. We would spend hours on scene. I would follow up. I would go to the, I would call. Those parents were survivors that meant the world to me. I gave too much of myself. I didn't guard myself emotionally and energetically. I invested too much in others. The first time in my life, I had to invest in myself. I had to understand and learn what self-love was. Still learning that. What, what, um not just worth, but esteem being, you know, arrogant and what self-esteem and self-worth are, They're, you know, completely learned. But what happened, Doc, and this was the mind-blowing thing for me, and this is when I've read a lot about, you know, spiritual stuff along with mental health crises, is, is one thing that absolutely did um, help was one night in the backyard, and this is Maybe PTSD, I've heard others talk about it with, with some other uh, depression and other bad states of addiction is I, I shattered into a million pieces, into a million pieces. If someone said, what's your name? I would have been a name given to me. That's not who I am. I could not. Everything I realized in life was, was a, a mental mind matrix. Mm -hmm. That everything was a construct of programming and i said do you have any opinion of your own mm -hmm. do you have any thought of your own you regurgitate everything that's been told to you what's been said all of it so i went through this really really weird experience and, and some have said it's called the dark night of the soul so anyway i add that because a lot of people are going to go through things in the mental health world that parallel this spiritual world that is very strange very woo woo and esoteric but the two are like a razor's edge, they go together. They go together. Why was Tesla, who was a genius, slightly nutty? They go together. So anyway, I, I had an experience, but that helped me. That helped me a lot. While I lost a lot of things, I was getting to put myself back together and still am, but I still struggle with that. And so, you know, where I'm at now is I fully acknowledge the complex PTSD, but last thing I wanna end with, and I know you have another client here, and I really wanna get this out.
Or but I also have a couple of questions for you too, though. Um, oh, go ahead. So, so no, even though we'll wrap this up uh, for soon, we have like maybe 10 more minutes. Um, okay. It, there was one thing that you had talked about earlier on, but I didn't want to cut you off because you were on a roll and, I, and, and, and you hit just so many amazing things and I'm so happy that I didn't interject at all. Um, was a term that I don't know if you have used before or heard of it, but it's called the imposter syndrome. Mm. The imposter, have you heard that one? Only heard of it, but I'm just don't know anything about it. And so most people experience an imposter syndrome when they do new things. So like, for instance, if you become a backward firefighter and you promote to engineer, you get into the job, you haven't really done the engineer job before, and but you're going to fake it till you make it. And you you keep hoping and praying that nobody will ever know that you are really <laughs> captain. You know what I mean? Right? Yes. And as you get to captain position and you move into yeah. the seat, same thing. <laughs> like, you know, you fake it till you make it and you pray to God nobody sees the chinks in your armor and, and that you are really, uh, mm. uh, you know, uh, an imbecile in the seat, you know? Yes, yes. Um, and you talked about this here as it pertains, you didn't use that word, but it was something that came up into my mind was, here you are faking it every single day, but you feel like an imposter going into work. Nobody knows what happened to you in the car just before you stepped into the, in, onto the tarmac or into the AF, AFB role is, is what I think you had said. Um, and, and so you, you put on this facade and this mask which really fit a lot of what you had said before, which is in the recon world, don't get caught, right? And so you, you were practicing all of this stuff as a recon artist, uh, make sure you get in there, have fun, but don't get caught. And, and nobody was catching you. Nobody was catching you, uh, except when your BC approached you and, and his uh, fit. And then they said, hey, is something wrong? And then you're like, holy crap, this is getting too scary. Somebody's catching on to me. That, exactly. means that, I'm, that means that I'm failing in my recon mission, right? Yes. And so, so it, it, I couldn't imagine how freaking hard it was for you to, to say, hey, man, I, I need help, BC. This is, I mean, that in itself. I mean, my dad used to say when he was alive, he used to say, you could tell when something moves you because all the hair on your body stands up. When you said mm. that, man, you made my entire body like just, you know, shake. It was, it yeah. was so impactful. But a next thing that I want to tack onto that is as you kind of, I know that you have a response for it, so I want to hear it, is that I couldn't imagine the fear that you felt approaching and saying, I have post-traumatic stress disorder, I have compl complex post-traumatic stress disorder, as it flew in the face of the negative messages that you had gotten throughout, you know, your early childhood saying that mm -hmm. you're weak, you're a failure, you're a pussy, you're all that stuff. Yeah. Right? Uh, and then for you to say, if I admit this, does this mean that everything that my family said is true? Right? right. Right. So I'll start up now and I'll, I'll let you take that part away because I can only imagine that you have thought about that too. No, boy, doc, you're, uh, you're good. You're good. So <laughs> have you done this before? <laughs> only on Fridays. <laughs> <laughs> well, Fridays, you are good. Um, yeah, you really hit on a lot of good things that I completely resonate with me um, and that I experienced myself, but, but you said it. Um, is this the nail in the coffin is is by asking and, and you don't want to be exposed and you said chinks in your armor early in the conversation and i remember um again a gentleman and a mentor of mine said nick when you exposed your alcoholism you showed a chink in your armor and i remember i said i'll never ever do that again i remember i mean i did that six years earlier and I, i'll never ever expose my weakness i exp i went like this hello and it didn't go well it's like oh mm -hmm. can't do that again not safe and so not safe tarnished my reputation for a bit mm -hmm. and um also made me feel right back to how i used to feel inferior less than mm -hmm. so i knew this is what i knew when i called that battalion chief that I've said this in a video, I've said it in writing. It was to this day the hardest thing I've ever done. 
killing yourself is not the hardest thing. Um, all the other things we've talked about thus far aren't, weren't the hardest thing. Those were, those were, those were outward braverly, brave projections. You know, oh, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. Having to stop and recognize, and I didn't stop. I was a million miles an hour. You can't, because otherwise I have to stop and be with myself, mm -hmm. be with my inner thoughts. Cannot do that. Must distract, must keep going. Caffeine, I'll take some, anything to keep going. Mm -hmm. So when I made that call, I'll never forget it. I was I, I just the phone. I wanted to throw it. I wanted to disable it. But but doc, it had gotten the the, the 15 pounds of weight loss of a, 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 a guy that I worked with and not just worked with. This was my family, my secondary family. We were super close. He, he, we talk in the office. He comes in after a call. And he's all, dude, you know, what is going on? You know, it's like, shit, I can't hide. It's starting to bubble over so bad. And I had been hiding it for a long time, <laughs> not just throughout the military in my early in my career from 10, but everything else just took its toll. But I had gotten really good at deception and being resilient. I know we got to wrap this up. So when I made that call, I often say it was the call that saved my life because it was. I was going to be on the 101. I had envisioned it. I had felt it. I had thought about it. Next thing was, was the action of manifestation on it. Mm -hmm. And I knew one bad call, one shift, one argument, one thing at home. That's it. Because I was so unhinged emotionally. I was so unstable. But boy, it was like this. Here was me walking in. And the only reason is in the military, I learned this. Mission, men, and then, you, you know, me, it was the three M's. Always, always put the mission first. Mm -hmm. As long as there's no safety compromise, but that's the SOPs. Ensure your men know the mission. The mission is why we exist. That came first. So we would train, we PT'd, we studied. That was my priority every day. To do something, to learn about this job for three to four hours, maybe not that long. Then... Then it, you guys can have your time. So the mission, always the men, and then yourself last. Now, that's not my philosophy. It is, but that, I learned that from the special forces. And the reason that was so big is I showed up every day because I was a captain and because those guys were my family. I can't abandon them. Mm -hmm. So I made that call. Yes, it saved my life. You know, it was... <sighs> Hmm. I, it's such a mixed emotion because here I am alive talking to you. And I know that my next mission in life is this 2020 was this when I was seeing stable, healthy people start to fall apart because of this pandemic. Well, I'm like, are you kidding me? Now I'm, I'm not, I, I had a very easy year, but I'm also experienced 2017 and 18. You couldn't, whatever you want to throw at me in life. Good luck. After those two years, there's no hell you could put me in. 2019 got to get better. 2020, I saw people breaking left and right. And that's when I said, Nick, now that you're getting better and you're, you're definitely getting healthier and starting to progress in life again, get my feet back on the ground because it took three years. You're going to bury this under the carpet. Yes, I am. I'm going to sweep it under the rug. And then 2020 happened. And I was hiking and going to Payson a lot. We have a cabin up there. And I'm saying that because I spend a lot of time in nature by myself. Mm -hmm. And I meditate a lot. Some other weird things, which help significantly. But the thought of meditation before becoming a meditator, oh, me sit down with my, yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. But but what happened was, is um, um, I lost my train of thought there. I apologize. No, um, you, you were saying that that you started to, to get out. So sweep it under the carpet. I said, what's the scariest thing you could do in life? You, you say you're not full of fear. What's the scariest thing you could do, Nick? You know what the scariest thing you could do is? Talk about mental health. Mm -hmm. You don't share your story. I had cousins in my family recently, not, not recently, in 2019 say, hey, Nick, um, why did you quit the fire department? People thought I just moved on. Or just no one knew. There was a circle of people and that was it. Mm -hmm. 
So when I said, holy crap, I'm close with this cousin, they respect and admire me and me them, that's wrong. And when people would say things and I'm like, actually, that's not true because I understand mental health now. So July of 2020, I made my first video and I went down to the creek in Payson and I pulled out a GoPro or my phone, I don't remember. And I thought, I'm a talker, I could talk, this would be easy. And it was like, oh, <laughs> I just started with a three minute video and things have kind of taken off since then, despite this pandemic, despite, despite a crazy election year, despite everything, um, leading to conversations like this, because I knew my next mission, my next goal in life, my next service to people was to help that person on the truck suffering right now, or in the police car, or in the military uniform, or post-retirement. I'm doing a lot of work with other post-retired people. Not everyone's 42 retired. Mm -hmm. So we got some older gentlemen and gals and um, life after retirement is lonely. And we know what happens to a lot of police in public safety when they get out and re uh, when they're done with their career and retire. Mm -hmm. I, I'm watching too many war heroes. And I mean, 30 year heroes mm -hmm. suffer right now. Mm -hmm. Suffer, loss of identity, purpose in life, gone. Camaraderie, gone. Major components to making you feel you know, uh, vigor and full of life and purpose. So I have my family, I'm, su I'm super busy. But um, the, the, the PTSD thing, I'm still learning. And I just, once I started talking, here's what I didn't know, Doc, and I know we got to wrap this up, is how beneficial it was for me. You know, serving others is really serving yourself. It's the most selfish thing you can do. And I always get weird looks. Selfish thing you can do is help others. What? Because you help yourself most doing so in the service of others. When I started talking to people, the floodgates opened. I actually had learned from the fire service, Nick, burnout, sprinting, guard. I would shut it down. All the things that were making me better, I stopped doing because I was so involved with social media, YouTube, Facebook, these groups, people messaging me, conversations, really helping. I'm not a counselor. I'm not a psychologist. I just had a story and I was relatable, but I had to go back to guarding myself. And so then I backtracked back. Now I'm much more careful with how I'm going to go about it and um, talking about this, sharing the story. And there's so much more to it because there's addiction. There is the denial. There's the hiding. I know the public safety. I know the mantra. I know the machismo mm -hmm. Don't show your, your chinks, you know must present this, you know, muscle head, I can do attitude. And you've got to love that about public safety and military guys. If we didn't have that mindset, it might not be what it is. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, 10% and more and growing are going to get left behind because of that culture, that culture that is incredible. So, but what I want to do is make it absolutely, and I know this is your mission, absolutely okay. Yeah, I broke my ankle, man. You'll hear this all the time. Tweaked my back on the job last night. Mm -hmm. Oh, dude, what happened? You don't hear, dude, I tweaked my brain over the last 10 years, man. I'll tell you what, I'm just being honest. Mm -hmm. But you're Captain So-and-so. That's right. Mm -hmm. And you know what the bravest thing I can do today is tell the next generation of my peers that this crap's taking its toll on me mm -hmm. and that drinking every night may not be the answer mm -hmm. and that my fourth divorce isn't because I'm not you know, just messed up. It's because I have problems that I re I will not recognize. Mm -hmm. So I, I cope with them. I cope with them. No, 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 no. I want to make this so common, but it's going to take a lot of time. It's an evolution, but I'm a new player in this game, doc. And I'm, you know, the PTSD is mind blowing. Um, but, 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 your, but your message is timeless. I mean, we may have called it different timeless. things in the day, right? But exactly. But it is, it, it's not something that's going to go away, but it is something that we could make sure that we don't have to suffer from because there is an opportunity to get better, to feel better. Now, that may not mean that you feel great every single day. They're going exactly. to be get smacked in the face with it, you know, even though you may have been, you know, in treatment for a long time. And that's oh. it. it's just realizing that you could overcome the humps a little bit easier than you could the times when you were down in the slumps. If I knew now what I knew at the beginning of this, I would have been full of hope. Yeah. Yes, you're depressed and in pain and maybe suicidal and maybe anxious. Maybe you've got a lot of detachment issues. 
if I had known and, and I had heard that, you know, I, I had hoped one day, you know, as my sister always said, she goes, Nick, that one day has come. And I had hoped that one day this would all be for something because come on, doc, you're, you're, you know, your doc, imagine everything you've worked for your entire life, everything gone professionally yeah. speaking. Yeah. Who am I? I was a captain. That was my identity. Mm -hmm. Wait, wait, I'm not that anymore. Who am I? I'm, I'm well, what am I? Well, who's I? Who's the one asking I, these things? Riddle, you know, just play my crisis, mind. Right? Existential crisis. Existential crisis. And that's usually what I tell people that aren't, you know, that understand the spiritual or mental health stuff. It's an existential crisis and it's big. And by the way, mental health is on the decline. We know that it's not getting better. Yes. These kids today, that's a big passion of mine. Yes. That they're addicted to their phones. They're getting EMFs coming in. They're constantly they're not sleeping. Kids mm -hmm. don't know what's going on in the world today. And I'm not, I know I'm generalizing with a broad stroke here, but you know, that's one thing we've done with my family is before I went out and went public was we've got to talk to our own family because I can't be a hypocrite and hide it from my right. kids. Mm -hmm. That rocked our family. I mean, they knew the last three or four years something was up, but we did a great job of keeping the show going. Family support was amazing. Here's what I want people to know moving forward and something we're going to talk about a lot is that when I said I wish I knew now what I didn't know then was the amount of resources, support, help, people mm -hmm. like you. What, what, what's going to come was I'm going to leave. We're going to leave. We're going to go about our day. I, I'm going to get a ton out of this, Doc. This was great for me to share this part of the story. You know, it's great for you to hear and learn. And you've got your story that I don't know. So but I learned a lot know, from you too, though. And this has been really helpful for me. You know? Yeah, I want to, I, 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 I'm a little passionate right now. I guess you got me fired up because. You're good. Well, you know, you created a part three for us. I hope you know that. And okay. <laughs> you, you got to part five. And I think that at least we're at part three. Uh, and then, and then too, I also want to yeah. say this, that I think that, I would, I, I, your wife sounds like she's an amazing lady. Oh, I don't know if you had a chance to watch, watch Josh and Anna on, on my website when they talked about their marriage and their relationship through his post-traumatic mm. stress disorder. But if oh, you wow. have seen it, if you could take a look at it with your wife and see if she would be willing to do something like that too, because I would love to hear her perspective on what it was like for her walking this journey with you because uh, oftentimes the the caregiver and the spouse and the loved ones are the forgotten folks on a trail but they're so yeah. strong right so i i know that we have to wrap this up now because i, I ha i'm yeah. on the clock right but, right right um, right <laughs> i cannot tell you how meaningful and and just you know honest and raw and I just am truly grateful to you uh, for doing this, Nick. Thank you so much for bearing your soul with us and, and doing this. This is, you're going to help a ton of people internationally. This is not just something that is contained to Mesa and Phoenix, right? Um, you're going to have people watching this from all over the world. And they're going to say, thank you for saying this, because this is exactly how I feel. And I didn't have the words for it. And for you, for you to say that is a huge thing. I don't, I only have my words, right, Doc? But I know we got to go. And you said it. When I listen to another human being, a man, a woman, young and old, from all over the globe, talk about it. I went, mm. you know what I left? It was a five-minute podcast or interview, an hour. It didn't matter. I knew there was hope. Mm -hmm. My motto was if they could, they survived, that means I have a chance. Mm. Yes, you do. So yes, so I completely agree that there that that the more this circulates and grows, the more people are going to go. Oh, I'm experiencing a conversation I had, and it's not the end of the world. So this is big stuff. We've got a big stigma to get over here. So give me another message of hope that you want to leave people with. Tell me another message of hope. If you could say something to to end this segment, this second part on that you that you want to share with people could be personally that that you you know because the next thing that we didn't talk about was andy and his role in being isolated or part of this journey too because he was your battle buddy and he was your your lifelong friend and so there's so many ways we could take this right yeah. and so, so give me one thing you want to end on 
I'll tell you about hope. Hope is when you've lost it all and you can't even remember what that word means. And you can't love yourself, but you can feel it from someone else or something else, like a group of people who sacrificed their own time. Hope is this day. Hope is getting to be a dad to my kids and not be dead. Hope is this game we're playing called life is worth it. We don't know what's before, what's after. You can have your religious convictions and that is fine, but here we are. And the more I get to know about life through physics and through other scientists, sciences and just history, the more you realize how astronomically amazing this is. Bad day yesterday, good day today, maybe bad day tomorrow. It doesn't matter. It's doing this in a continual vibration and we get to experience it. Look, how would we know what love is without the feeling of hate? Or how would you know what happy is without sorrow? The two go together. Hope and pain and sorrow and pain go together. They're polar ends of the spectrum. And so just because you're in a time in your life, and I spent a couple of years there, where you're on one end of no hope and despair, that's all I had riddled in my blood, was despair, pain, negative, screw you, anger coming out and projected through anxiety and uh, insecurity. And then slowly, just chiseling away, maybe another reading session, another counseling session I didn't want to go to, a medication I don't want to take, the exercise I don't want to do, but all of these things build momentum. Mm -hmm. I hope that anyone listening to this realizes that life is worth it, that life is, it gives me goosebumps. I know how much it's worth it because you're like, you know what someone said, what do you know? Before I started talking about this, this, they go, what do you know? You have it all. You only have it all and realize you have it all and want to tell you've lost it all. I didn't lose my wife, but she stuck around. That's worth it to me. Mm -hmm. My kids didn't ask for a dad that was unstable, that didn't take care of themselves and kill them himself. They asked just to come into this life like I did. Don't look at the things that have happened to you and label them bad or good. I did that. I became a victim. When you, when you become a victim by circumstances, I'm a mental health victim. I, I, I had that thing happen to me when I was 12. This isn't fair. You are nailing your own coffin. Hope is saying it's the I can. I had to listen to motivational tapes again. You know, I had to listen to anything, but it's doing the work. And you know what I've realized now? Without hope, hope is not an overstatement. It's not a cool word. It's not, it's not whimsical. It's not ridiculous. It's the word you have to hold on to. Well, why? Why go through this journey without hope? The hope is what? That you get healthier, that you get better, you get your life together, and you will, and you will. Um, and the way I look at it is this. I should not have overcome this. I shouldn't have. Everything was stacked against. I should not. There should be no conversation. And yet there is. So if you think you're in that bad a place, just please, please, I dare you to call me. I dare you to email me and message me. I dare you. I dare you. Before you do anything stupid, let me show you where you can get and show, I, I, you'll see hope again. I hate to say it. It's not a whimsical word. It's, it's real. It's a very real thing. But remember, there's a spectrum of opposites. Mm -hmm. Hope, despair. You can't live here forever. You do this slow incremental work. You see hope come alive. I love it. That's great, man. Yeah. Nick. And what I could do <laughs> is I could, share, I could share your information if you want to have your contact information shared. And, um, and, and you know, and everybody has my cell phone is on the internet. I mean, I make sure that nobody walks alone, you know. In fact, yes. on the challenge coin that I made, that's exactly what a Latin says. No, no one walks alone. And I think that mm -hmm. you do that exact same thing. And like people find like people, right? We're on the same mission. And, yes. and I think that being mission driven like that is really what makes a difference in this world. So thank you. Thank you for, for doing what you're doing. This is incredible. Um, and you and I will schedule a part three, four and five soon. Yeah. Hey, and before we go, Doc, thank you very much. I can't tell you how awesome this was. I cannot wait to watch some videos, uh, especially on that couple.
Um, but thank you. Thank you so much because what you're doing is way more important. I have a road in Avenue. You do too. But thank you so much. I can't wait to do more of this and, and, and meet you in person. Thanks so much, Nick. I appreciate it, man. Thank you. All right.